Hi, I'm from YoK. You're watching the stream. On today's episode, we are going to be looking at this book, Mediocre: The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. The author is Ajoma Aluo. Ajoma, nice to see you. Welcome to the stream. It's great to have you for a whole 25 minutes. That is not going to be enough, but we're going to do our best. Ajoma, the title of the book. How many people do you think you have triggered with the title alone? You know, it was hilarious to me because I think that um, we've been talking about mediocre white men for a very long time. And I felt like it was shocking to me when people were like, wow, such a provocative title, because I'm like, isn't this what we call this? Um, so some people certainly were upset about it. But also, I think no matter what I titled the book, those were people who were not going to pick it up. You know, I, I am definitely writing for people who know at least something is wrong. And there are a lot of people who recognize this phenomenon and, and want to know more about it and how it works and what we can do about it. You, you took a moment for you, which was quite a personal moment, which is the start of you deciding that you wanted to write the book. And then what you write is very universal. Can you take us back to that moment when you thought, I need to put this down in a book? Certainly. Um, and, and I talk about this in the beginning of the book. You know, the inspiration for this um, was born in a, of, you know, a lifetime of frustration, but a particular moment. And the moment was, you know, trying to be in a writer's retreat. Uh, with other women and this was a time to relax to focus on our craft it was a retreat you know re that was really developed because women so rarely get a chance to focus on their work and all we could really talk about and what we needed to talk about were these men these white men that were impacting our lives and our careers so heavily and in it as people kept saying why does this you know why is this happening what is behind this you know, I kept seeing the story unfold in front of me, the, the path that led to where we were in that particular time and where we are today. And I wanted other people to see it so that we could start looking at the patterns and looking at society as a whole, instead of treating each individual bad actor like an individual, instead of part of a systemic problem. And so I wanted to really show that story to people so they could see it too. We are live on YouTube right now. If you'd like to talk to Joma Oluo, you absolutely can. Jump into the comments section and be part of today's discussion. Our questions start with Edward McKinley, Joma, who is a big fan of your work. Here's Edward. In her first book, the author wrote that if you are white, born, raised, and living in America, you are a racist. And we will not be able to reckon with our history of white supremacy, our history of racial violence, until white people like me are ready to lean into that fact and start doing some very strong and powerful inner work. As far as questions for the author, I have a million, but I also think it's important that white people like myself start doing the work for themselves instead of putting people of color in the position of having to mentor us, teach us, guide us, and ultimately make us feel better about everything. We need to do this work. It's our turn. You know, I think that that's very true, that we do need to do the work. And I think it's also important to recognize when people hear um, someone say, you're white and you grew up in, in a white supremacist society, chances are you are, you are racist and white supremacist, you hold these beliefs, people get upset because they're like, I'm filled with love. But the truth is, is we're talking about systems and how we participate in them. And we're talking about overarching stories about the value of populations of color that we can't, no one is exempt for. And so it is important if you do have that love, if you do say, you know, I have nothing but love in my heart for people of all races and ethnicities, that you'd be willing then to investigate your complicity in violent systems that are harming populations of color. I want to just go back a few days on Twitter. Have a look here at my laptop. And there we've got a Joma's book. <laughs> and there we have a protester, perhaps a rioter, I finished reading this book yesterday, Prophetic, and then Ajoma, you write a whole book about the violence of white male mediocrity, and then you look at the news coming from DC and you say to yourself, yeah, it tracks. You take us back in your book to the Wild West when the European settlers came to the United States in the first place. And that is where you start with your journey. And that's a little bit like that meme, this is how it started, this is how we're doing. If, if, we, if this is how we're doing is the Capitol building riot, how do, you, how do you draw that timeline between those two things? It's almost like you knew what was going to happen. You know, I would say 
it's interesting because people have been asking, how can you, you know, how do you know when to put this book out? You write this book right at the right time. And, and unfortunately, I think any time would be the right time. I think that mm -hmm. if you don't know your history, this looks like a, su a surprise to you. You're like, how, where did this come from? But if you know your history, um, you know that this sort of violence was an inevitable, inevitable step on this violent path we've been on since the founding of this country. This country, you know, was founded on violence and oppression and it, the power that it has has been maintained that way. And anytime there's a threat to it, the response is incredibly violent, especially to white male power. And so if we look at history, we see this over and over again, you know, starting with the founding of this country through the violent expansion through the West and the genocide of native peoples. We see this, you know, time and time again, whenever we make social progress through the civil rights movement, we see this violent backlash. And what we're seeing today, you know, is that same ideology, that idea that might makes right and that white people in particular, white men, have manifest destiny and have a God-given right to the land and the people um, is, you know, we're seeing today that reaffirmation of that entitlement when it feels threatened by social progress. Gemma, yeah, let me show you some thoughts that are coming uh, from YouTube. William I, putting everybody in the same bracket, tsunami fit, Gee, vilifying a race, is that not racist? There are a number of people who are quite frustrated that they feel that you are talking to everybody who is a white male. Are you? I am. I am. And I, and I am not necessarily saying that every white man is you know, out protesting and, or out trying to have a coup or, you know, um, actively, openly supporting violent white supremacy. But what I'm saying is, is that we have a, a problem in white male identity and the white male power structures. And so what I am talking about is a power structure in the most predominant and powerful power structure in this country, which is, you know, white supremacist patriarchy. And I would say, you know, even in, in the UK, we see this as well. And so absolutely, this has been built in your image, whether you like it or not, if you are a white male. And that means because you benefit from it, that you have some responsibility for it. And you need to look at it openly. If you can't handle hearing about it because it makes you feel implicated without stopping and going, wait, am I implicated? Then chances are you're not actually invested in making change. You value your comfort over the ways in which this violent system is crushing and killing people of color. A little bit here in your book, this is about status. By making whiteness and maleness their own reward, we disincentivize white men from working to earn their privileged status. If you are constantly assumed to be great just for being white and male, why would you struggle to make a real contribution? Who do you know? in this world that you have seen who embodies that description? Name names. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I would say, you know, right now what we're looking at in this country is, is textbook for this. If we're looking at, um, you know, many of the people in our Senate, if we're looking at the president of this country, if we're looking at the leaders of many of our failed businesses, what we see in our white men who, who give the promise that you could be an everyday Joe of no special talent and you deserve greatness. That what you need is daring, what you need is the ability to overpower others and then you will lead. And none of these skills, of course, actually lead to that. But people want that. You know, I think part of the appeal of people like say Donald Trump is that he made any kind of bumbling person who was afraid of their own mediocrity and failure feel like they could too lead. When we look at Trump's business record, you know, this is not someone you would go, yeah, this, this, make, this person makes strong, smart choices. Um, what, you, what you see is someone who fails upward time and time again. And that is what we've been told everyone, you know, every white male should be able to have. And so we see this on a grand scale, but I would also say if you've ever worked in any kind of office setting or even academia, you see this time and time again, where someone looks better in a suit and tie than they can actually lead. But because they fit this persona, 
um, they're moved ahead of the people who are actually creating and, and want more. But I will also say part of what this speaks to is, is a direct conflict, because there are many white men trying to figure out exactly what it means to be great and what it takes. And what they find is what is asked of them and expected of them isn't actually greatness. And there is an inherent internal conflict that that creates as well, where white men often feel like failures because perhaps their actions are not bringing the success promised. But it is exactly what our society is telling them to do, to strike it out alone, to never compromise, to use aggression and oppression to get ahead. And it's when it doesn't work, when it isn't rewarded the same way it is rewarded for Donald Trump, they're wondering, what did I do wrong? You know, or when it's not bringing happiness or, or fulfillment, they're wondering, what am I doing wrong? And so we have to recognize this is, this is something that harms everyone, including white men. There's a part in the book where you, you take a moment to talk about some very high profile Congresswomen who, who came into power in 2018. So Alexandra Ocasio, Cortez, Ilhan Omar, Ayanna Presley, and Rashida Taleb, and how them just being in a, a traditionally male space was irritating the President of the United States and also a lot of people around them, including their own Democratic Party. So last summer, uh, I, I just want to take a little moment where uh, the four of them gave a press conference and spoke out about they were not going to be deterred by the President or anybody who was criticizing what they were doing and how they were doing it. Have a listen. Despite the occupant of the White House attempts to marginalize us and to silence us, please know that we are more than four people. We ran on a mandate to advocate for and to represent those ignored, left out, and left behind. Our squad is big. Our squad includes any person committed to building a more equitable and just world. Almost any day in United States politics, you can see one of those four women um, having struggles, battling uh, with the establishment. What is going on there? Is it just old fashioned misogyny? It's misogyny and racism, and I think it's also a threat to our power structures. I think it's really important to recognize that across party lines, people are invested in making sure that any progress we make doesn't rock the boat too much, even in left political circles. And what these women represent with their new ideas, with their unapologetic focus on the most marginalized populations in our society is a threat to political structures that, you know, that keep our, our leadership on the left on top as well. And so absolutely we see this, but also what we see is that many white Americans, the thought that someone who doesn't look like them would represent them is something completely not only foreign but hostile to them and so the threat that they have in not you know trying to emulate a you know white ideal in not trying to over focus on the most privileged parts of our population over the needs of the underprivileged um, for them makes it feel like this is not their representative. It doesn't represent them and therefore it doesn't represent America because we have allowed the United States to be synonymous with whiteness in this country. And so I do think it is both um, misogyny and racism that impacts these four women of color who are really trying to be voices for the unheard. Some questions from YouTube. This is Mr. Solo. How dangerous is black male America? You know, I think that what we're looking at, um, when we look at patriarchy, uh, patriarchy is dangerous across racial and ethnic spectrums. And I would absolutely say, you know, as a black woman, that many black women, black femmes, um, you know, that is a risk to us wherever we see toxic masculinity and violent patriarchy. Systemically though, um, black male America is incredibly disempowered. And I would say, you know, the risk to our systems, to the average white American is quite low. And so when we talk about this, what I'm talking about are power structures. And so when we say who is a power structure, when we look at representation, when we look at even, you know, uh, pay grades, when we look at who is in our management offices and who is in our, you know, political, in our government, 
we are not seeing an overabundance of black men um, making choices, you know, that harm us. And so I would say, in fact, what we're seeing is the systemic and deliberate disenfranchisement and, um, you know, imprisonment of black men in this country by a white supremacist system. So I would say the danger as a political structure doesn't exist. What people are wrestling with right now, and, and, and it's interesting because you've written a, another book about uh, race, which is, so you want to talk about race and, and how difficult it is for some people to even just talk about the obvious that's right in front of our faces. Uh, but people now, in 2021, are wrestling with this idea of uh, some white males taking out their frustration and then becoming violent. Uh, and this is what Jared, this is how Jared frames it. I'm really interested to see how you see that journey towards violence. Here's Jared. The crisis of white masculinity in America is the crisis of America itself. And as white men feel that they are the victims of perceived persecution or the belief that they're being left behind in the global economy or in any number of cultural wars and conflicts, they are becoming more and more radicalized and willing to join fascistic movements, anti-democratic movements, and are becoming more and more politically and also physically violent. What was interesting in, in your book, Joma, was that the violence started right at the very beginning from taking away lands from Native Americans. It didn't seem like it was a new kind of violence. And that's what my takeaway was from watching and reading your book and your analysis, that it was violent right from the beginning of the, the start of America as European Americans know it. Absolutely. And I think that we have to recognize that, that the founding of this country was incredibly violent and brutal and horrific and started not only with the genocide of one population of color, but with the forced enslavement of another. And then this country was built over generation after generation with the exploitation of labor of populations of color. We have to recognize that that history didn't go away, that in fact, you know, our founding institutions in this country were built to uphold those power structures and to make sure that that power was maintained. And if we don't recognize that, learn our history, and then learn how you know this violence is embedded in our institutions, we will not be able to rid ourselves of it. It doesn't just expire. You know, an education system built off this violence doesn't expire. A criminal justice system built off this violence doesn't just expire. An economy built off this system doesn't just expire. We have to actually investigate it and tear apart the ways in which it is wed to violent white supremacy. On YouTube again, you're really inspiring a lot of conversations, Joe. I know, I know you're used to this. This is Fly with Derek. How long is it going to take before things ever change since it seems America has always had this issue? What are the main things that will lead to change? You are asked this question all of the time. I really am. And I think it's really important to recognize that part of why we haven't been able to make progress. So there's a couple of things that happen. One is that we have, you know, almost exclusively framed discussions on racism around personal feelings and personal animus. Um, you are a racist if you walk around actively hating people of color, right? You are sexist if you walk around actively hating women. And then if not, you are a, a good person, part of the solution. But what we're actually talking about are systems. We're talking about systems built to advantage some populations over others, systems built to exploit the labor of members of our population and to give people a sense of comfort with that exploitation and oppression. And we are told to look at interpersonal relationships only because people make money off of these systems and gain power from these systems and don't want us looking at it. So the, when we do engage systems, right, when we start to make political change, systemic change, what we see is an immediate violent backlash like we saw this past week, right? Um, because people are so afraid of systemic change. And so we have to recognize it's by design that we haven't been addressing and making the sort of change in our systems because we've been told time and time again, it's not possible or that's not where the problem lies or we have been punished so viciously for any progress we make in that area. And so it is vital that we look at that and recognize that this is where our work lies and we have to push through. We have never ending opportunities. These systems were built by people. 
They are not immovable, but we are told that they are, and we are led to believe that they are so that we won't do the work. But we are powerful. If we come together and actually start engaging in our systems to really push for change, we can create it. And that, if we couldn't create it, there wouldn't be such a violent backlash towards our attempts. It's because people see that change coming and they are afraid of it. Adrian is a scientist and a community organizer, and this is his take about now what do we do? Here he is. I think there are a lot of people in the United States that are ready to reckon with racism and white supremacy. And the majority of those people are black, brown, indigenous, and people of color. Um, you know, white supremacy is something that threatens our very existence and that is pervasive and is embedded within every system of this country. And so I think it will require white people um, giving up the, the advantages that they have for the mere fact that they're white. And so that will be the challenge. That will always be the challenge. Gemma, there was something I really wanted to touch on because you speak so comfortably and confidently about uh, white supremacy, uh, patriarchy. But when you work on a book like this, there is a, a toll when you talk about racism and white supremacy and hate. And people who don't like you talking about that make it very, very clear. Can you share that part of your work? Do you mind? Um, yeah, you know, I think that anyone who, especially if you are a person of color, especially if you are a black woman, um, we, when you threaten the system, the system comes back for you and people who are invested in the system come for you. And absolutely, my experience, while it might seem extreme if you're not doing this work, is not unfamiliar to many black people who have been fighting for liberation and for change in this country. And so, you know, we have been threatened um, we have had, you know, officers brought to our home when we were swatted. We have had to move from our home due to regular harassment and threats in our home. This is a regular occurrence, and it's I am not alone. Um, and if you look at history, and even if you look at the book, you'll see time and time again, generation after generation, the way in which uh, people are made to pay for speaking up around these systems. But I think it's also important to note that this comes for people, everyday people who aren't writing about white supremacy, everyday people of color who do something, anything that inconveniences the power structure, that inconveniences whiteness in this country, um, you're often met with a violent backlash. And we see this in plenty of our news stories where, you know, black people can't have a barbecue or, you know, sell lemonade without someone calling the police on them, right? These violent repercussions um, are waiting for all of us no matter what we do, if we ever challenge the system or even inconvenience it. Mm. One more comment. This is from Liz Rainey. I'm, I'm going to ask if you could answer this fairly swiftly, because can you believe it? We're almost at the end of the show. <laughs> how do you have these types of conversations with people who are still in denial of how racist America is? You know, I would say this is advice I'm going to give to white people because I believe that this is a conversation that white people need to have with each other. I don't believe this is the duty of people People have written about it, we've talked about it, we have our books, we have our articles, you know, we've said what needs to happen. I would say, t tell your own journey with other white people. Share how you came from believing this wasn't a problem, because there was a time when you did, to where you are now. And take people with you, and take them on an empowerment where they can join you in making change. And also investigate where you still have to go. And show people the changes you're working to make in yourself, and in your life, and in your community right now. Joa Aluo, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, for unpacking a lot of your book, but not everything. So if you want to read Joma's work, really dig deep. There's some beautiful stories about history in the United States that you may not know. How did we get to where we are right now? So worth actually digging into. So two books I'm going to recommend to you. One is on my laptop, so you want to talk about race. That's the first book that Ajomo wrote, and that was just a few years ago. Uh, and that will help you have those uncomfortable conversations, Liz Rainey. And then 
Oh my goodness, she's in book club heaven. So many book clubs, but mediocre. The Dangerous Legacy of White Male Power. That is by Ijomo Oluo. And that is one way that you can also catch up with her work and look out for some of the very many online events where you can hear and talk to Ijoma Oluo about her latest book. YouTubers, thank you for your conversation. Really appreciate it. I'm Femi OK, signing off from the AJ Stream Home Edition Studio. I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.